Today on this old house, new technology will stop air infiltration on our entire project. Just got a head start here. Now, how long will it take to pressurize and seal it all up? About 90 minutes. And we put the finishing touch on a wall system that's seven layers deep. What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice. See this main roof form? We're just going to pull that forward to it's even where this existing deck is. Definitely says mid-century modern. The money's in the detail. That is beautiful. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house here in Jamestown, Rhode Island. This is our bungalow project and we're taking it from about 1,000 square feet and doubling it to almost 2,000 square feet. Now you can see that the framing is complete and we're pretty far along with the rough plumbing and electrical. Now our homeowner is trying to get a home that is net zero and that means that the house will only consume as much energy as it can make. And to get there, we have got to get this house really airtight. Well, Richard has found a new technology that's going to help us do that. Air infiltration is a constant battle as we try to make a building energy efficient. And even with new construction, there are plenty of places where there are cracks, penetrations, places where air can leave the building, heat that you've paid for, and cold air can come in. Now, historically, we've always chased after it with caulking and weather stripping. But what if there was a way that we could seal every single crack in a building? It would be a game changer. Jordan Kreitz is going to show us this new technology. Now, it's not exactly new technology, is it? No, this has been around for a little while as far as the concept yeah. in the duct systems. Right, we've used on duct systems yeah. to seal them up tight. Yeah, so we use uh, positive pressure basically to uh, put a sealant inside and identify those leaks and seal them with the positive pressure. Cool. So you got your blower door test. How's our existing house? This is new construction. Sure, we just completed our test and we're at 3.8 ACH 50. So ACH, that is air changes per hour. How much air would leak out of the building when you're pressurizing it, right? Mm -hmm. So what's what's the worst? Sure. I've seen them as high as in the 20s. Okay. So 3.87, what's that equivalent to? Uh, that'd be the equivalent to probably this window being open about five inches or so. Under pressure. Correct. That's a lot of heat leaving out. Exactly. Okay. All right. So what's the prep that you have to do? Sure. So the prep process will actually uh, tape off the windows so that the sealant doesn't actually seal the windows if they do in fact leak some. You got to seal every single opening, anything that's going to leave to outside. Yes. That, that will eventually be closed off. Correct. Okay. So Richard, what we're going to do is use this hole where the deadbolt will eventually okay. be to simulate an air leak. And we're going to put this mesh here uh, and we'll actually be able to see the technology seal see this. Seal right up. Okay. Correct. Okay. Good. We'll come back and check that when we're done. Here's the basic setup. Here's our blower door. Yeah, good. The fan right, right there, yeah. So this is what we're going to use to put the positive pressure yeah. in. Uh, here's the laptop that essentially is controlling the whole system and okay. telling everybody what to do. Yeah. This is a pump system inside of this box here that's going to spray to, the material in. Yeah, it's going to pull the material and pump it through the lines to okay. the spray nozzle. And then this is actually the material here. Oh, the there ceiling. it is, right yep. there. So it looks a little bit like paint in that condition. Very similar. All right. You ready to go? Yeah. Just got a head start here. Okay, great. Now, how long will it take to pressurize and seal it all up? About 90 minutes. Okay, cool. All right, so it's been about an hour. How'd we do? Uh, we are down to one ACH 50. Wow, so we started at what, 3.8, just under four. Mm -hmm. All right, so that means we can have smaller heating and cooling equipment, right? Exactly, we can right size the mechanicals to the Perfect. Home. All right, let's go check the door, how we did. Okay. All right, so it's almost completely blocked off. That is really cool. Pretty good. So you're gonna pull that. Let's get this off of here. Look at that, the bullseye. Sealed up perfect. Mm hmm. Great. So, is there any place where we can see it going through the outside? Hey, here you go. Right here under the stairs. Uh, so, look at that. Between the old boards, it found a crack, even though there's insulation outboard of it. That is amazing. Yeah. It finds everything. So, what about existing buildings? Do you have to just do new work? No, this can be used in retrofit applications as well. Uh, just need to uh, protect the finished horizontal surfaces in the space. And that's probably got as much possibilities as any. There's a lot of leaky houses out there. A lot. All right, so once we get it this tight, there's one more thing we got to think about, right? Getting fresh air into this building, mechanical ventilation. You got it. All right, that is really something. All right, Kevin, 
Nice job. Thanks. All right, so the reason that we sweep this place top to bottom and clear out all the debris is so that we can get this place laid out so that all of our next step, all the trades come in, they're going to want to poke holes everywhere, they're going to destroy this place in about a week. So we've got a lot of built-ins, a lot of specialty things going on that we want to get laid out so that we don't have ducks in the way and returns and thermostat wiring and all that kind of stuff. So the better we can do that now, this is the last chance we're going to see this uncovered. Gotcha. We're going to set ourselves up for success. So the first thing we're going to do is doors. So we'll cross-reference the, the plan for door swing, and then let's just check it in, in the field here. So this door in this bathroom showing a right hand, and it looks like a right hand door will work well here. So I'm just going to check measurement for a rough opening. 210 and a half, and that's perfect for a 2-8 door. And we know it's a right hand because we put our butt to the butt, and whichever way your hand swings is the door swing. So that's a right hand. So I'm going to label this side as the hinge side. I'm going to write 2-8, so that way when they come to measure for doors that it's there. And then I'm going to indicate which way the door is going to swing. So that way when the electrician comes in, the first thing he's going to want to do is where can I put my switch? So now he knows he can put a switch on here. Had we not done this, he could have guessed and we put the switch here. Next thing you know, the door opens and you never discover that until the finish. All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to lay out the bathrooms. So we'll start with a shower here. And this is a 48 by 32 inch shower. You want to mark that there. And we've got 32. Okay, and then 32 here. All right, so that means we need a blocker there for our shower glass. All right, so this wall is our valve wall. So we're going to let the plumbers know that the valve is on this side. All right, and then the shower ends here. So we're going to want a block for backer for our shower glass right there. So the opposite side here, we've got the toilet up against that outside wall there. So we know a toilet rough is 18 inches off of one side. So we're going to go 18 and a half to account for drywall. And fortunately, that's going to work well with that joist right there. Okay. So we measure 18 off of that center line. That gives us a total of 36 inches for that toilet location. So the next thing we're going to do is the vanity, and that is what? 54 by 20. Okay. So we got 54 from this mark. So I try to make it painfully obvious so that anybody can see and, it, and that there's, so, there's no mistakes. All right, Kevin, the next thing we're going to do, you're going to really appreciate when we go to do finish work. We're going to mark all the stud locations on the floor so that way once the drywall's over, we know where every stud is in the room. All right, so... Five seconds worth of work and it'll save us yep. an hour of laying out studs at the finish. Awesome. Our barn is a garage and a little workshop on the first floor and then some living space on the second floor. But the main reason this building was built was to serve as a place to put our solar panels. And that's going to go a long way to making our house net zero. But you can see what's going on with the roof here. The solar company would not install the arrays on wooden shingles. So in the center, there are asphalt shingles, and then around the perimeter, the wood shingles to match the rest of the house. It was designed to face due south, which is perfect for solar. The only problem is we've got ourselves a lot of shape. So we've called in landscape architect Tom Ryan. Tom, nice to meet you. Kim. So what is the plan for the trees here? Are they coming down? Are we cutting them back? How do you get us some sun? Well, a combination of the two. The uh, trees that are on our property can come down. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that are on other people's property hanging over will cut back. Okay. And, and when that's done, will we get enough sun on our roof for the solar that we need? Well, that's due south, so we'll get really good sun midday all through the afternoon, and with some trimming over here, we'll also get some morning sun. So Perfect. it should be enough. All right. So what did the homeowners ask from you in terms of what they needed from the yard and the design? Well, this is a family that does projects, and so they're looking for an area to do projects, kind of the spillover projects from the, from the barn, a place to spill out and okay. be worked on out here. 
Um, and also, they've got two young boys and a place for two young boys to get out and run around. Right. Uh, so the combination of those two got us to a design which has a kind of a more formal backyard and a working side yard. So we are right about here right now. Um, this is the domestic working side. What types of jobs and tasks do you envision going on back here? Well, right off the porch over here at the corner, there's a place for a grill, uh, which is close to the kitchen. Around the corner, there'll be a place for uh, trash cans and whatnot. There's a fence that will be in line with the front of the house and tie in over here to right. the fence that goes along the property line. And then obviously a table seating area here in the middle, a yes. place for dining in the evening possibly. Yes, as well as a table that's not so precious you couldn't do woodworking mm -hmm. on it. Okay. So all the domestic activities, as you call it, happen behind this fence and then we've got sort of more of a formal front yard. Let's take a look at that. Um, that fence sort of goes right here. Yes. And then all of what you've got in the backyard starts kind of off of the porch here. Yes. So the center of the formal space in the back is a big oval of grass. And outlining that oval of grass is a line of perennial flowers that would come and go through the season. And then a hedge, which is up about this high, and will create an edge to that oval space. Oval, huh? Yeah, oval. We found that oval looks a lot bigger than it actually is, it takes up a little less space, and it's still pretty functional. Feels like more lawn, less mowing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, directly across from the screened in porch uh, it will be a, a circular area of pavement with a fire pit on it. Like that. Yep. There's a couple little gaps in the hedge to little spaces in the corners. Yeah, I noticed that. And you've got them actually labeled Theo's room, Nate's room. What's that idea? Yeah, well, we're giving the boys a place outside that's all theirs to do whatever they want. And gotcha. it's behind the hedge, it's, it's separated from the neighbors by a hedge, and it's this place where you just go build stuff. Yep, not going to be pristine in those not two little rooms. Not going to be pristine at all. Okay, fence line continued throughout, and then along the main road here, what's going on? Well, along the main road, there are some remnant pieces of a privet hedge here, and we're going to transplant some of those and supplement them to close this off so you don't feel like you're in the street for the most part. But we're going to leave a gap right here in the middle, mm -hmm. and the gap will have a gate in it so that you have a way to get in and out, and you'll have that little bit of peekaboo, but you'll have a lot of privacy. Okay, and then this takes us along the main road to what is sort of the formal front of the house. What are the design elements that I'm looking at? In front of the house, uh, we want to set this as the formal front from the house to the rest of the world. So we're going to put in a picket fence that along the road with some flowers at the base. We're going to put a trellis over the walk to the front door and some flowering shrubs along the front of the house. Uh, and then a bit of hedge at the end to kind of close off this, the front yard space from the asphalt driveway. That's terrific. So we've got front yard, sort of big backyard, and a domestic side back there. Excellent. Got a little bit of something of everything here. It does. It does. Right, well, thank you, Tom. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. It's not often that our homeowner is also our architect, and the good news is, is that Don knows exactly what he wants. The bad news is Don knows exactly what he wants, and he's actually drawn up how we are going to finish off this little knee wall and these structural posts here on the front porch. And Jeff and Garrett are in the shop trying to figure it out. Hey Jeff. Kevin, how are you? All right, so uh, some figuring to do to build this porch railing system? Yeah, so we've got a, uh, a decorative column wrap that's going on our, you know, the six by six posts that are existing there. We've, right. got, a, we've got a wrap that goes around it. And it's uh, sort of flat and straight at the bottom, but then kind of arcs into this flare up at the top. Yep. And what are these sitting on? They're going to sit on this rail cap, and he's got mm. this rail cap drawn that comes to a full point. Uh, so we had to figure out what that taper is. So let me show you. So everything custom in this case. Yeah, this, um, we're gonna start with, with this material, but we're gonna end up with this. So we're talking mahogany. Yep. And you've got a, uh, what is that, full two inches? Full two inches, eight quarter. Eight quarter, yep. all right. And then wow. we, we're gonna clean it up, and then uh, basically we're gonna create this profile here. So that's a solid piece tapered on both sides. Yep. Um, how are we making this? Yeah, so, Obviously, the router bit's not going to work, so <laughs> we're, gonna, we're actually going to use a planer. Oh, okay. So, but in order to do that, a planer will plane material flat. We've got to create a tapered sled to run this material through where this side is down at the origin and then this side is up. 
that creates an 11 degree bevel so that when we slide the material through, the planer blade's gonna cut this material away. We're gonna put it in the other side, we're gonna slide it through, and we're gonna keep working until we get to the center line. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, so the bevel's right in the center now. So we created a template on site of the actual conditions. So this is exactly what we want to replicate. These holes represent where our six by six structural posts are gonna go? Exactly. That's where the post goes in. All right, so remember that column top had that sweep to it. Mm -hmm. So the way we created that was we actually started with a piece of one by eight, and we've gonna add these pieces with pocket screws, and that we just made these on the bandsaw. So that gives you two sides, and you make a three-dimensional how? So those two pieces that we just made create the front and the back. In order to create the side, we've gotta make it bend to follow this curve. So we milled this material down to about 3 16 of an inch. And then we've created these jigs that we can clamp together right on the job site so that we can glue it and assemble it in place. So we're off to the job site. Let's go. Garrett, you've already got yourself a plan for how we're gonna slip this over those posts? We have a plan. What is it? What we're gonna do is we're gonna remove a section of the post. So you've already cut those away, we've right? We've cut these out and we created a shiplap spline, yeah. so it's gonna go back in again. Clever. After we slide the cap over the top. All right, coming up to you. Oh, I like that right there, okay. So that gives us this continuous look to this cap, and then the treatment for these, that pillar right there sits on top. We'll sit right on top as soon as we put these all right back in again. Pretty sweet. What do you think, Jeff? I think it's gonna be good. Yeah, yeah. I do too. All right, so uh, six more to go. Six more to go. Back in the 20s, our house was covered in white cedar shingles. At some point after that, maybe when they started to fail, the house was covered in asbestos siding. Well, both of those layers were taken off, and now we're going back to the white cedar shingle that was on here originally. So we've got ourselves a traditional material sort of on the outbound side, but going over a very untraditional wall system here. This net zero thing we're going for, me, you built us a pretty intricate wall. Yeah. So this is a little model that we made so that you can illustrate all of the components. We've got two by six exterior wall, space 24 inches on center. That limits the frequency of our thermal bridge, thereby allowing us more insulation per lineal foot of wall than wood. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna get filled with open cell insulation. All in here. Yep, then we've got 7 16 OSB as our sheathing, an air and water barrier applied to that. Then we've got an engineered panel here, which is two inches of polyiso insulation, adhered to a structural 7 16 panel with another barrier of impregnated air and water barrier. On top of that, we've got this cedar fabric, which creates a drainage plane 
behind our shingles. And then lastly, our white cedar shingles, which are pre-dipped with bleaching oil. Beautiful. And so, Tommy, what's the total R value that this system gives us? The total R value is almost 30 right in this wall. And code is what? Code's 21. So we're well above that. We're well above it. But the big deal here is this continuous band of uh, rigid insulation bridges the whole system so that there's less chance of air moving and air escaping right there. I mean, and so this is a very strong wall assembly yeah. when we're going towards that net zero. Absolutely. Keeping the conditioned air in the house and the weather outside. Absolutely. Right. Okay, so uh, side wall shingling, that's our job for today. That's right. All right, so what we have are white cedar shingles that have been dipped so all five sides are coated with a bleaching oil, which is really nice to protect the wood again. The light makes it last. If you notice the joints, they're actually staggered. And there's a separation in here also. And that's important because you don't want water to migrate between these joints, especially on the starter course right here. There's two reasons why you do a starter course. Number one, you want to be able to hide that joint on the first course, but also you want to get the angle of the shingle to be correct with the rest of the wall. And you want to mail them as close to the reveal mark as possible, so you, you want to keep it up, you just don't want to keep it too low. Are you using staples there, Tommy? Stainless steel staples, the staples really hold well. And the key when you're installing shingles on the sidewall and a roof is you don't want to use too many. Keeping them from the edge of the shingle three quarters to an inch, in this case, we just nailed this one here because we can slide the next shingle behind it. You wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. And three staples at the most, so in a real wide one, you can put three staples. right there. That weave's looking good. I love it. All right, Tommy, so what's coming up next week? Well, the homeowner wants to get involved with the project, so we're going to help them with some built-in. All right, well, until then, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Jeff Sweener. And I'm Tom Silva. For this old house here in Jamestown, Rhode Island. Next time on This Old House. Tommy, this is a console that we're building for the powder room. Um, I wanted to do something that was this mix of old and new. Richard, for years you have told us with a heat pump that it has the ability to find heat even on the coldest of days. So there's still heat outside to be had. You just have to work a little harder at it. We've got the interior finishes. A lot of decisions need to be made. We're ready. All right, so um, where do you start? 